can we please give a huge bar uh, cheer and welcome to John Bostock. Good evening, everyone. I want to take you back in time. It's the 8th of September, 1936, around midnight. We're in Penros, a small village on the remote peninsula of Lynn in North Wales. Three men calmly drive up to what had once been an old farmhouse, recently demolished to make way for an RAF bombing school, still under construction. The men carrying five cans of petrol and a supply of fire lighters calmly set fire to the deserted sheds and offices on the site. They then make their way to the nearest police station, a few miles away, and hand themselves in, their work accomplished. The three who carried out this attack were all pillars of society in their respective professions. Louis Valentine, a Baptist minister, on the left, um, Saunders Lewis, a university lecturer, and DJ Williams, a school teacher. They were the unlikeliest of saboteurs, but this action that has gone down in legend as Tanning Lynn or the Fire in Lynn ignited the Welsh nationalist cause and earned these three men both notoriety and acclaim in equal parts. This photograph was taken in 1936, about the same time as the arson attack. In the 1930s, the Ministry of Defence had announced their intention to build an RAF training school on the Lynn Peninsula at Pennyberth, after two English sites had been rejected due to protests from naturalists and historians. However, despite widespread objections from all, um, all walks of life, uh, sorry, from all walks of life, the Prime Minister of the time, Stanley Baldwin, pushed through the decision without any local consultation. The three men were all members of the fledgling Welsh Nationalist Party, Clyde Cymru, with Lewis Valentine as its first president. And it is Lewis Valentine who we turn to that is mainly his story that I'm telling today, with some of my own family history thrown in. Lewis Valentine was born in a small village, Clandullis, along the North Wales coast, midway between Abergelly and Colwyn Bay. It derives its name from the River Dulas, which you can see here, which winds its way through the village, bound for the Irish Sea. In past times, you would have driven through the village and perhaps tarried a while on, their way, on your way to one of the tourist destinations, such as Clandudno, Conway or Anglesey. These days, the North Wales Expressway, the 855, bypasses and ignores Clandullis, cutting off the village from the beach, which is also hidden uh, by a seemingly unending row of caravan parks. However, if you travel about a mile inland to the neighbouring tranquil and beautiful hamlet of Rid of Oil, seen here, you get a glimpse of what Clandullis was like before modern life came along with this wrecking ball. One of the most momentous events in British history occurred in Clandullis just over 600 years ago, but appears to be almost unknown locally. In 1399, Richard II was ambushed by Henry Bolingbroke on his way back from Ireland at Penman Head, a rocky outcrop just outside Clandullis. He was forced to surrender and was eventually deposed as king, thus ending 300 years of the Plantagenet dynasty and sowing the seeds for the War of the Roses in the mid-15th century. Strangely enough, there's no commemoration anywhere in the area to mark this turning point in British history. The only first-hand record of the event is from this illuminated manuscript, manuscript by French historian and poet Jean Preton, who just happened to be passing by and witnessed this historic confrontation. Its only other more recent uh, claim to fame is as the birthplace of Louis Valentine. I know Clandallus well as it also happens to be my mother's birthplace, who was born in 1923 and who is still going strong in her 101st year. She spent her childhood in a house named Hillside, and I'll ask you to try and remember that name, Hillside, situated on the small lane of Clip Turkin on the eastern outskirts of the village. This postcard is from Clip Turkin around about 1910. Hillside is the farthest house on the right-hand side of the road, 
one of the two large semi-detached houses. Glendullis and Hillside hold a special place in my heart. It was here that I spent many happy holidays there as a young child, together with my grandpa, grandma who I called my grandma who I called Nine in Welsh, and grandpa who I called Ty. For someone brought up in the north of London, I felt a wonderful feeling of freedom, climbing and roaming free on the large limestone hill which you can just see overlooking Cliff Turfing. Limestone is the key to this part of Wales. It was the lifeblood of the village and provided employment for its men for 200 years. Limestone was first quarried in Clandallus as far back as 1696, but during the 19th and 20th centuries it became a major industry with the limestone being transported by a specially constructed railway line from the quarries to the jetty on the beach where it was shipped off all over the world. The extent of the deep devastation to the area can be seen in this aerial photograph from the 1930s, which shows three enormous craters on the outskirts of the village, and the jetty can also be clearly seen. The glory days of limestone quarrying are now in the past, and many of the quarries have been filled in and returned to nature. However, in the past, everyone in the area seemed to have some connection to the limestone quarries. Both my great-great-grandfather and my great-grandfather were quarrymen. Life of, the life of the limestone quarrymen was hard and relentless, with long hours in appalling conditions, and many people died before their time. My great-grandfather, Thomas Roberts, dropped dead at the age of 38, leaving my tide having to find work as a farm labourer at the age of 14 in order to bring money in for the family. This photo shows a group of Clandallus quarrymen taken around 1900. And he here below, you can see a, a typical quarryman, a person called Jack Day, taken in 1875. You can see the toll it's taken on him. But returning to Lewis Valentine, and this is what the lecture is all about, he was born in 1893 to Samuel Valentine, a lay preacher and a checkway man at one of the limestone quarries and a Mary Roberts. His birthplace was Hillside. I don't know whether you can remember that. For those of you who are paying attention, you're perhaps beginning to see a connection between Lewis and my family. So Mary Roberts was the sister of my great-grandfather, Thomas Roberts, hence the family connection. This meant my grandfather, my tie, was first cousin to Lewis Valentine. At this time in North Wales, the Protestant religion was the main driving force in the community, which emphasised the rewards of hard work and strict obedience to the Gospels. That meant for most people in the village, there was chapel several times on a Sunday, and most of the po population were strict totalers. My mother's side of the family were Methodists, while the Valentines were strict Baptists and attended the Bethesda Chapel in the heart of Glendalus, seen here in the picture. My grandparents lived a few doors down in Clip Turfin from the Valentines in a small cottage called Mountain View. And my mother clearly remembers regular Sunday tea visits at Hillside with Uncle Samuel and his family. But by that time, Lewis was married and was an ordained Baptist minister in Cladden In about 1933, my tie purchased Hillside from Samuel, who was moving away from the district, which was how my mother grew up in the same house that Lewis had also once spent his childhood. The Bethesda Chapel was an enormous influence on Lewis as he was growing up, and it was his intention to become a Baptist minister once he had graduated. However, the First World War got in the way, and although he had already strong pacifist leanings, he volunteered in the Royal Army Medical Corps as a stretcher bearer. The picture of uh, over here shows Lewis as an idealistic young man in 1915, just before he was subjected to the horrors of the First World War. His role as a stretcher bearer meant he witnessed some terrible sights in the worst battles of the war, including the Somme, culminating in the living hell of Passion there, where in 1917 he was subjected to a gas attack which left him blind and unable to speak for several months. 
These experiences, plus the loss of a close friend, left an indelible mark on the young Louis Valentine and left him with a visceral hatred of war, which stayed with him for the rest of his life. The war convinced Lewis that his calling was as a back minister of the church, and in 1921 he was ordained as a minister in the largest Baptist chapel in North Wales. Over the next few years, he established a reputation as one of the great preachers of his generation, and his fame spread throughout Wales. It's hard to imagine today, when religion plays such a small part in people's lives, how much these pre preachers were hero worshipped and were almost the rock stars of their day. There is a unique Welsh word for this called hill, which was a special characteristic of traditional Welsh re revivalist preaching, which led to a surge of intense emotional and spiritual fervour between the preacher and the congregation. The upsurge in religious fervour, especially in North Wales, can be traced back to what is known as the Welsh Revival of 1904-1905, when a group of charismatic preachers taught Wales, converting thousands of people. This mass movement had an enormous impact on people's lives and continued well into the middle of the 20th century. In addition to his deep Christian faith and his pacifism, Lewis was becoming increasingly involved in the Welsh nationalist movement, fueled by his passionate love of the Welsh language, which he felt was in danger of being subsumed by English. Language gives the nation its unique identity, and the Welsh language is no exception. For centuries, beginning with Henry VIII, the English had tried to suppress and destroy the Welsh language by banning Welsh in schools and in workplaces, often through corporal punishment, with the barbaric use of flogging, using the sinister sound in Welsh knot. Here, here, the picture here, you can see how awful it was. The, this wooden plaque was put round the per a girl or a boy in a school who was, was heard speaking Welsh and they had to wear it until the next child was caught speaking Welsh and then it was put on them and it was a, it was a means of humiliating the child. At the end of the period the child with a token or all of the children uh, might be punished by beating so it was a very, uh, and that went on until about the 1950s I think. So this and other systematic tools of oppression was bound to lead to a renewed independence movement. And by the early part of the 20th century, many Welsh patriots were looking to form a new political party. In 1924, Lewis met other like-minded colleagues in Carnarvon who launched Clyde Cymru in 1925, with Lewis Valentine being elected his first president. So this is the background that led Lewis, this upstanding citizen and minister of the church, to that lonely airfield on the Lynn Peninsula. That's sad, sad September night in 1936. For him and the other two leaders of the new reform Clyde Cymru, the decision to build a training school on Welsh soil felt like an act of pure English vindictiveness. And the decision was made to strike a blow for Wales and the Welsh language by a symbolic act of arson. But for Lewis Valentine, who by this time was a staunch pacifist, under the influence of Mahatma Gandhi, he was also a means of protesting his hatred of war, which came out of his experiences in the First World War. At the trial in Carnarvon, the Welsh jury could not come to a verdict, so there was a controversial decision to hold a retrial at the Old Bailey in London, which angered many people in Wales. At the real retrial, Lewis enraged the judge by refusing to engage with the court in English, and he gave an impassioned speech on behalf of these beliefs from the dock in Welsh. Of course, it was all in vain. The men were convicted and were sentenced to nine months' imprisonment in Wormwood Scrubs. Here is the telegram which was sent back to Wales saying that they'd been found guilty and sentenced to nine months. Following their release, they returned home to Wales as heroes who were met by a cheering crowd of 12,000 people in Carnarvon. I should mention here that for many, many years the subject of Lewis Valentine was almost a taboo subject in my family. When his name came up, it was always in the context of him being the black sheep of the family, and they quickly moved on to another subject. It's only recently, when my mother knew that I was writing about Lewis Valentine, she opened up 
and she astounded me by saying that although she was only 13 at the time, she remembers clearly how proud her family and the people of Clandallus were of their most famous son and gave him a hero's welcome when he returned home to the village. Of course, the fire was nothing more than a symbolic gesture. Within a short period of time, the training school was up and running as though nothing had happened. Louis Valentine's job as a minister had been kept open and he recommenced his life in Clandudno, preaching to a large congregation. From this time onwards, Lewis settled back into the life of a Baptist minister and withdrew from the centre stage of Welsh politics. But this one defining act had ensured his place in the mythology of Clyde Cymru. He had also become a respected poet and writer, magazine editor and literary critic. Throughout his life, he continued to push the case for the Welsh language and occasionally reunited with his other two co saboteurs who you can see here when they met later on in life. That's Lewis in the middle. But Lewis also had another claim to fame. At this time, he also wrote the words of a patriotic hymn which he decided, decided to set to the tune of Finlandia. Lewis was a serious admirer of both Sibelius and Finlandia, Finland, and felt their situation in respect of independence in many ways mirrored that of Wales. Choosing to set his words to one of the most achingly beautiful tunes ever written was an act of genius and ensured that this hymn became so well known that today it is now regarded by many people as Wales' second national anthem. In 1996, a memorial to Lewis Valentine in the shape of a pulpit in local stone and slate was built in his hometown, Clandallus. It reads, To the glory of God, in memory of Reverend Lewis Sentwood Valentine, 1893 to 1986, Minister of the Gospel, Nationalist, Pacifist. Opposite the memorial, there's another more secular tribute of Lewis Valentine, where a local pub is named after him. It is a fitting tribute and a supreme irony. What Lewis, a lifetime, lifetime long teetotaler, would have made of this can only be guessed at, but I would hope that he would have been rightly amused. But what about his legacy? I'm sure he would have been delighted that Wales has more autonomy and its own parliament, the Senate, seen here. And of course, he, he, it would have been a great source of comfort to him to know that the Welsh language has enjoyed such a great uh, renaissance and its survival now seems assured well into the future. His views on modern life, however, might have been more mixed, in particular the godlessness that he would have perceived around us. He would, no doubt, still have wished for a full independence for Wales, especially in today's uncertain climate following the political and social upheavals of recent years. And how do I feel about my first cousin twice removed? He was a man of his time. His world's not my world, and his religion is not my religion. But looking at his life, he was a man of principle and conviction who believed in the fellowship of man with an overwhelming desire for world peace. In contrast to most of the self-serving and venal public servants and politicians in office today, he comes across as a towering figure of integrity. And my conclusion is that his was a good life, well lived. We need people like him more than ever in our fractured world. To conclude, I would like to play a small part of a, um, this hit, the hymn, which I believe is Lewis Valentine's greatest legacy his beautiful patriotic hymn to Wales. And I've chosen a version by Daphne Irwan, a well-known folk artist in Wales, which has an appealing simplicity that goes straight to the heart.